Hey guys. So we're here today to talk about Aviary and our content delivery system. So for those of you who don't know, Aviary is a photo editor SDK and a suite of apps based on it. Uh, the SDK has a fully baked and customizable UI and a number of high quality customizable imaging tools. Uh, we are currently on iOS, Android, web, Windows, and server, and we have a number of partners, a lot of users, and have had a lot of photos go through our system. Uh, so who are we? My name is Mir. I'm the lead server side engineer at Aviary. You see my likes and dislikes over there. <laughs> and I'm Jack. I'm the director of engineering, and same with me. So some of our tools have uh, content associated with them. So namely effects, frames, and stickers. We uh, sell and distribute content packs, so frame packs, effect packs, sticker packs, which each include items that you can use within the tools. Uh, we also provide messages to users to let them know about the availability of new content. And I should mention that when we started this model, we had all of this content bundled in the binary. We were pushing updates to push new content. Uh, and that quickly led us to our first story, uh, which we'll be coming back to throughout the presentation. Uh, we'll call it the fat, tiny situation. So we want to dynamically deliver the fat, tiny stickers to our users. Fat, tiny is this adorable cat down here uh, who's got himself into some bread. And we don't want to have to update our app to uh, give this to our users who are actively using it. So that will hand it to me. So in order to solve the fat tiny situation, we created something called the content delivery system, or we'll referred to it as a CDS. And the initial version that we had of this allowed us to solve the first problem that we had in the fat tiny situation, which is we want to be able to deliver content altogether from our servers. Uh, the system, I'll just gloss over it, it's not really important, but the first version of this, important things to note are that we had to sort of pre-compute everything and put it on uh, in static files, because it was all hosted on static files on S3, which is Amazon's blob storage. And so it was a very inflexible system. Everything had to sort of be figured out in advance. And uh, there was no server generating these responses when a device wanted to figure out what content was available and it would hit a server. It wasn't our server, it was Amazon's server. And also mentioned, uh, because this is a Mongo meetup, we were using MySQL at the time, and we realized that did not really work for reasons we'll go into. So, Version one came out, uh, we launched it in I think, February of this year. It worked well, it solved the initial fat tiny problem, but then we had a second fat tiny problem that we wanted to address. So our story was we wanted to display the same fat tiny sticker pack, but we wanted to target only users of the app pick stitch. Like Jack mentioned, we have an SDK that's embeddable in people's apps, so pick stitch is one of our uh, large partners. We wanted to be able to target only their users, only those who were in Japan, and only those who use iOS 7, because we realized that for generating revenue, for selling content, targeting specific users based on specific, what we call scope parameters, was very important as the company grew. So again, I'll mention that those three bolded terms on the second line, uh, users, what app they're using, what country they're in, what language they speak, uh, or rather set, have set their devices to, what uh, operating system they're on, what platform they're on, what version of the SDK they're using, all those things we call scope parameters. They're things that define who the user is, who's making the request to figure out what content is available. So the question was, how can we do this because we couldn't do it with version one? So we came up with version two, CDS. And I'll just quickly uh, go over the stack that we use. You'll recognize this guy, MongoDB. But the rest of it, imagine that they're Users out there, Jack mentioned that we have 50 million <coughs> monthly active users. They're all on different devices, and they want to figure out what content is available for them to download. So they make a call to our system. They initially hit a content delivery network, which uh, is just an additional layer of caching that we have. And we use a company called Akamai to provide that service. It filters through to a load balancer, which distributes load across servers that we have. This whole system is running on Amazon's cloud, uh, Amazon Web Services, their cloud platform. The load gets distributed across servers that are all running Node.js. And Node.js is interacting with a single cluster, uh, Mongo cluster, that's our backend. And all of this is managed through an internal system that we have that we call Paula. And we'll get to Paula later on, but uh, all of our data is stored in here at Mongo. 
So why did we choose MongoDB before we show you what we actually did with it? Uh, as I mentioned, we were using Node.js, and I don't know if any of you have familiarity with it. It's a technology that's getting more and more popular, but with the interaction between Mongo and Node is incredible. It's extremely seamless. Uh, they're both JSON-based, which makes writing queries in Node to run against Mongo incredibly powerful and flexible. It's schemaless, and uh, one of the things I should mention is that all the scope parameters that we listed before, who the users are based on what platform they're running on, their version of their operating system or the SDK, what country they're in, what app they're using, we don't know that list of parameters in advance. Uh, the previous speaker, what's your name? John. John. He mentioned that you, know, you don't necessarily know what you want to filter on in advance. You don't want to have to pre-compute all that. We had the same exact issue. We didn't want to have to define a schema that defined, that restricted what we were able to selectively set content, set content to. So being schemaless in MongoDB was incredibly powerful for that. Uh, this was a very read-heavy system. If I go back to this slide, these are 50 million people out here. They're making requests constantly, millions and millions of times a day. They hit a system that needs to deliver content really quickly. Mongo excels at read-heavy operations. And uh, it was a relatively small data set because we don't have that much content out there or that many different permutations of the content that we can deliver. So uh, you know, that made us choose MongoDB for another reason because we didn't need one of those big data service providers out there. All right, so a little bit on how it works now. Uh, when, when the device makes a request to our server, there's a two-step process to deliver the content. The first thing that the device receives is a manifest, and that is a file that defines the set of content that the user on that device should see as well as the version of that specific content item that the device should download to present to them. Uh, so once that manifest is retrieved, the user, uh, user's device makes another request to our server for each content item that it needs, meaning that it has never downloaded before or that it is out of date on with respect to its version, and gets a JSON response that tells the device what the metadata for that content pack is, so how to display it, and then delivers as well uh, paths to all assets where it can download things like stickers and frames. All right, so one more addition to the fat time situation. Uh, Nir mentioned that on the first version of the system there was a lot of excess data delivered uh, because we didn't know who the requesting device was, what the requesting device was. So the story is that we want to manage the fat tiny sticker pack as a single entity, but we want to deliver it to each device in its own optimal format. So how do we do that? So we came up with something called the response formatting model. So on the left side, we have what's called a content entry, and that's like a sticker pack or an effect pack or a frame pack. <coughs> and that is a single JSON file that describes everything there is to describe about that content item. Uh, so in the middle, we have entities called response formats. And these are JSON schemas, and they serve two purposes. One is to uh, define the format and the structure of the responses that we're going to deliver to a certain type of device. And the other is to say how to populate that response with the correct data. So uh, starting from the left, the uh, there's a process called deployment by which we generate responses. So starting from the left, uh, the content entry is uh, processed by uh, a piece of code that takes response formats and uses them to generate actual responses. And each one of these is a JSON document, as I mentioned, and is stored in a collection specific to the type of thing that it is. So I'll go into a little bit more detail now. Uh, I've, for reference, left the diagram up in the upper right corner but the following slides are really based on this model. Uh, so content formats, we didn't see those in the diagram, but they're very important. So they define exactly how a content entry is structured. And again, a content entry is something like a sticker pack or an effect pack or a message, frame pack, et cetera. Um, so it's a JSON schema, uh, which is a specification for JSON that's gaining traction, I would say. Uh, and it basically defines the type of each field and the structure of a JSON document. Uh, we added a couple of properties and custom types to handle things like 
uh, images that we need to upload or fields that weren't standard uh, to JSON schema. And the purpose of this is to define how a content entry is structured and also to validate its entries before it is actually inserted into MongoDB. And I should mention that we did a little bit of work to extend the functionality to accommodate things like the custom types and the added properties. Uh, so now the response formats, so there is the entry which is validated by the uh, content format. The response format is that middle hollow shape up there. It is also a JSON schema, as I mentioned before, and its purpose is to define the structure of the response and to define how a response is actually generated based on a content entry. So there's a special property that we added called data key. And that defines which field in the JSON of the content entry should be uh, looked up to populate a given field in the response. Um, so I'll go into even more detail on that now. So I mentioned that the process by which we generate responses is called content deployment. So uh, there's, from our management system, someone creates an entry. Uh, so they post to an endpoint, it's validated against the content format as I mentioned, and then it's ready for insertion. So we insert it into the collection that holds content entries. Uh, when that succeeds, we have a second step, which is find all relevant response formats. So a relevant response format, uh, let's say that the CMS entry, the content entry, uh, is an effect map. We would find all uh, response formats that are for effect packs, and they, they're specific to different types of devices, I should mention. So uh, a response format could represent the response that a standard resolution iPhone 4 expects, or an iPad Air expects, or an Android device expects with a specific resolution and form factor. Uh, so we find all of those response formats, and we deploy. So the process of deploying uh, is as follows. Uh, in the response format, for a given field, we look at the data key. Uh, so for ID, the data key is identifier. Uh, we look up that identifier in the, CM, the content entry, the CMS entry, and find its value. So in this case, that's com.ideary.stickers.234fe. And we populate the field in the response with that value. So on the right, you see ID now has the value com.ideary.stickers.234fe. We do the same thing for metadata. There's uh, a hierarchy in the organization, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we just use the dot to separate that hierarchy. So we look up the metadata dot display name value, which is hats, and we populate the name field with that. Uh, the same goes for images. that are really just dot or objects that have paths uh, for different sizes that we have uh, that we need to deliver. So the icon image path is populated with that field. And if we encounter an array that we want to map, it's the same process. We just look up the array, get its value, and insert it. And there's one more thing here of note. For each response that we generate, we append a field called version key. And that uniquely identifies that response. Uh, so if I go into the next slide, I mentioned that manifests describe the set of content and their versions that are delivered to the device. Uh, so this is what a manifest looks like, roughly. Uh, there's a stickers array, and that says this device should be able to see these two stickers. The, the one with identifier, com to here, that sticker is up to the and the one below it. Uh, and the version of that content it should have is represented by this version key. So that tells the device to get this version. Um, same for frames, there's a single frame that this uh, specific manifest says that the device should have access to, and that's the frame pack with identifier that's displayed there. So this is sort of an interesting problem for us. We need to be able to figure out what the most recent and applicable version key is for a given content pack. In fact, for every content pack in the manifest. So manifest deployment uh, is very similar to content deployment, but there's an extra step. Uh, we need to, as I said, efficiently find the most recent version keys for every content pack, or sorry, every content entry of the right format. So to do that, we use Mongo's aggregation framework and we have a three-step query that we do. The first step is to match uh, all documents, so all responses, 
that were formatted with the correct format ID and that are in the set of identifiers that the uh, manifest contains. So once we have that set of documents, we sort them in a reverse chronological, chronological order. So we have the most recent ones, and then we group them by identifier and select just the first version key, meaning the most recent version key for that identifier. And with that, we have a mapping of identifier to the most applicable and most recent version of the content. And we're able to populate the manifest with the correct version keys using that query. So I'll hand it over to you. So that is some heavy stuff that Jack just went into. Uh, and some people look confused out there. So I just want to bring us back to a higher level again and explain why we want to do this, just so everybody's on the same page. So if I take us back to this slide, this column here, these shapes, are the responses that we want to actually deliver to the devices, right? We said we want iOS retina specific devices that are able to consume us data and expect to see it in a certain way. We want them to get the triangle because that's how they expect to consume the data. And the squares go to, let's say, Android devices that expect a different format for the data but they're all derived from the same thing. They're all seeing the same sticker path. So internally, we only want to put one circle in there. We only want to put one, that tiny sticker pack in our system, and we want to have an automated system that figures out what the devices all need. Right? Does that make sense? Question. How often do people expect to get these things delivered to them? Like so the, I, we'll go into that a little bit, but oh. every time that uh, a person basically launches an app with our SDK, a call is made to the manifest endpoint, which is, you know, after we deploy all this content, we put together a list of what content the specific device should download. This is retrieved on every app launch. And if there's anything in here that the device does not yet have or that they don't have the most recent version of, they'll make additional calls to retrieve that content. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. All right, so now that we've gotten this far, we have a bunch of manifests. Those manifests all uh, have list what content is available. And to bring us back to the second fat tiny situation, the question that we had was, how do we target this to only Japanese users in Japan, let's say, who are using Pink Stitch, right? Or, or I, and are on iOS. So every manifest has a scope, which is a combination of all those different scope parameters. Any possible parameter that we could want to target on, we could put them in a scope. In Mongo, every manifest that's deployed has a scope associated with it. And that scope says, these are the users that should see it. Let's just walk through these examples here. Manifest one here. We're targeting people who are using ABC. Let's say that corresponds to Pixitch. So only Pixitch user, users should see the content that I'm not showing here, but that's part of this JSON document in Mongo. Uh, and only those users that are in Japan. Now, notice that this is an array. That could be in Japan or in China or in Ireland. Right? It could be any combination of things. And using Mongo makes that really flexible. And then we have a formatting scope. Not only are we targeting these users, this is only consumable by users who are using iOS. We only want iOS users to use this, so they should get a format that is relevant to iOS and to a format that is uh, consumable by at least iOS version 7.9. And on the right side, we have users that are sending requests constantly to try and get their manifest, and they list off all of these scope parameters. This user is hitting our server and he's saying, I'm using Pixitch, I'm in Japan, my language is Japanese, my platform is iOS, and I have OS version 7.2. So he's sending this request. We have a bunch of manifests in our database. The question is, how do we send him the right response? So this is where more Mongo magic comes. So on the left side, you have that user sending us requests. We've color-coded the different scope parameters they sent us. I'll mention that the OS version, which is stored, OS version and SDK version are stored in dot notation for versions. But we can't do range comparisons for that, so we convert those into integers in Mongo. Or sorry, but they're stored in Mongo. That way, they're converted when we do this querying uh, into integers, so that we can do range comparisons. And so we generate a query dynamically. This is all generated when the request comes in. We take all the parameters that they sent us and we plug it into this query. And I'm just walking through this query. There's some nuances here that we're leaving out. We're happy to go into it later on. If you guys want to talk about it? Uh, but this query basically says, look at the manifest collection and find a manifest that is relevant, is targeting API key, either ABC or not. Meaning, we've either specified that we want that target, target is specifically to pick switch users, 
or we haven't specified at all who we want to target it to, meaning it's more general than that. Same thing for country. A manifest that is targeting either specifically Japanese users or is not specifying what the country is at all. Same thing for language, platform, and for Mid OS version, because it's a number, and this all we want to do is make sure that that user has a format that is consumable for at least up to his uh, SDK version and not more than, or his OS version and not more than that. I'm not sure if I said that correctly, but uh, we're saying find a manifest where the minimum OS version for consuming that manifest is less than this particular user's uh, operating system version. And then after we generate that find part of it, we also want to sort this, right? We might get a bunch of different manifests that are targeting different users. We might have a manifest out there that is targeted for Japanese users and another one that's targeted for Pixish users. How do we decide which one to pick? Because we only need one. So we have this sorted here. We basically have a predetermined uh, hierarchy for which scope parameters are most important to us. If we match on API key, that is the absolute most important thing. And so if we match on API key, that's what we're going to send back, even if we have other conflicting manifests. And we sort out all these different things. And if we match for all of these different scope parameters, that means we've deployed multiple versions of the same exact targeted manifest. So the way that we differentiate between those is ID minus one, which says just give me the most recent one. Limit one, meaning only get one of them, right? So at the end of this query, we get a manifest that matches on the most uh, narrowly tailored manifest that matches on all these different scope operators. We only get the most recent one, and if there are any conflicts, the system resolves it automatically. Does that make sense? If you have any questions, again, feel free to ask us that. Uh, all right, so, the manifest is delivered to the user. The user now has a list of all its content. And to go back to the question that was asked, uh, that, that's delivered once per every time they launch, right? But like I said, if their content is either out of date or if they don't have a particular piece of content, they need to get the most up-to-date version. So what they'll do is they'll just take that version key, which Jack said uniquely identifies all of our content. All they need to do is just say, give me the content with the version key that's equal to this. And because each of those version keys represents a specifically formatted content response, we know exactly what to get. So the Mongo query for this is way simpler. Just find one piece of content that matches that version key, and we just send back that response. So uh, you might be saying, well, this is quite cumbersome, and if we add a lot more of these, the query just gets more and more complicated. And uh, as we know, querying across all these different things, especially when we, when we don't know what they're going to be in advance, makes it pretty much impossible to index this properly. So we don't want to have to do this really complicated query every time. Uh, these requests, we have millions of users out there. A lot of them are sending us the exact same combination of scope parameters. So if they've sent us a request before, we cache the response. We've done the heavy lifting. We've just cached the response that we sent them before. So we store that in Mongo as well. We have a collection called cache manifest and another one called cache content. And when a request comes in, slight detour is taken before that query is generated, it first checks in the cache manifest collection to see whether or not we've ever addressed that response before and done this whole complicated query. And if it matches anything, we have the response in this collection, we can send back that response. We don't need to do this whole complicated thing. If not, the detour is taken back to the complicated query. And after that response is sent back, asynchronously, we'll add that to the cache so that we don't have to do it again. So, so. <coughs> All right, so uh, the system that manages this internally, as we mentioned, we call it Paula. A lot of people ask us why we call it Paula. You will find out the answer to that question if you come to interview at Aviary. We are hiring, and, uh, and that's our way to incentivize you to come. <laughs> we don't have t-shirts. So we don't have t-shirts. Uh, so as I mentioned, content formats define uh, the structure of how a content entry is. So, uh, meaning they say exactly what the JSON for, say, an effect pack should look like. So one of the advantages of that is that we can validate the entries before we insert them into Mongo to make sure that there are no problems. Another cool side effect of that is that we can auto-generate our collection UI for all of these content types in a way that means we never have to change our front-end code uh, when, we make, uh, when we add a field to an effect pack. So this is uh, the actual page where we create an effect path, uh, and each, each field that you see here, each text field is a uh, JSON, has a JSON uh, schema, sub schema for the field. 
that is a string. This one has a special property that says it's a long string, so the next box is big. Uh, the checkboxes you see here are booleans. Uh, there's number support, and as you can see, there's image support as well, and that's another reason we added the custom image type to, uh, to the JSON schema functionality. So just uh, two more cool use cases that we found for Mongo and building the system. So Paula, that system you were just looking at, that's our internal management system, but we don't necessarily want every person in our organization to access every different part. There are parts that are only accessible to admins to turn permissions on and off. There are parts that are only accessible to devs, right? We don't want designers coming in and changing around our schemas for our database. Uh, so we have a collection, a user's collection for who has access to Paula, and we can use Mongo's cool uh, push and pop onto arrays to manage the permissions. So every time a request comes into Paula, Every time anybody clicks on anything, basically, and an HTTP request is made, we check whether the user who's logged in, there's authentication, is the user who's logged in, does he have permission to access this particular part? So our routing mechanism in Node uh, has permissions that are associated with every endpoint, and those are enforced through Mongo. And the second thing, uh, we, we'll go into the numbers a little bit later, but we scale this out to an enormous number of users very, very quickly, and we want it to be very confident. So integration tests were a critical part of designing this. And uh, doing that in Mongo, if any of you have had the ability to do that, it's actually a lot easier and a lot more straightforward than having to build a schema designing uh, query into some, if you're using MySQL, for example, to put that into your integration test where you'll have to drop and recreate your databases and your tables all the time. This guy's nodding, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so uh, writing integration tests, which you want to happen really fast, every time you make a code change, you want to get it through an integration test as quickly as possible. Doing that in Mongo, where you don't have to recreate your entire database every time, is very, very easy. All right, so uh, we've gone through the system, and here are the takeaways. So we built this over the course of uh, three months and deployed it, and pretty much within three weeks was rolled out to uh, 20 million monthly active users. So uh, that was pretty quick. But it, it worked and it scaled very gracefully and we see very little load in our system uh, basically due to the architectural decisions that we made and I guess also the CDN to be fair, but uh, it's working very well. So we had very few struggles with Mongo and we were very happy with it for our specific use case. But that said, we did uh, sort of omit a lot of workarounds for little things uh, that Mongo didn't support. We wanted to do some of the queries that Nir showed are in reality a little bit more complicated, uh, but in general very happy. Uh, very seamless management, and we have two very happy server-side engineers who don't have to maintain it very much. Sorry, one more time. <laughs> so uh, the future, that was the present. The future, uh, one thing that's not listed on here is we plan on expanding this to the rest of our network as well, right? We mentioned that we're up to 20 million users. We have a lot more monthly active users than that, and this system is growing. We're putting more and more partners on the system every day. Uh, we want to be able to support, one thing that we're working on now is being able to support translations. So we mentioned specific devices should be getting stuff that's formatted and consumable by that particular device, but people also speak different languages, and content has text associated with it, titles and the descriptions and stuff like that, and the names of different effects and, stuff, and stickers. So we wanted to be able to to have this system also, uh, when it determines which particular piece of content or manifest to send, to also figure out what translation is appropriate to. If the user sends this language, we should know this guy speaks French, he's expecting this content to be seen in French. So we're building that into the system now. Granular user targeting, so uh, all these different scope parameters are sent, but we also have a totally separate part of our infrastructure, which is an analytics system, and we constantly gather information about what different people are doing in our app. Uh, maybe we could use AppBoy for parts of that, but we gather all this different information, and we, if we were to look at that data and aggregate that data and be intelligent about it, we would know that users who tend to have these different combinations of scope parameters, or who do this particular thing in the app repeatedly, they're more likely to buy this particular type of content. So we want to target that content to them. Right now the system doesn't support that, but eventually if we combine our analytics system and this content delivery system, we could hopefully automatically realize, like, here's a cluster of people that are more likely to buy this content. CDS, send it to them. And the last thing, Paula, we mentioned that we're using that internally, and, but we have a permission system and an authentication system, and we have a lot of partners out there that use us. So one day, the dream is to open it up so that all our partners can use it. 
uh, and they can log in and manage their own content and deploy their own manifest. And that shouldn't be too hard to do because it was built for that purpose. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us. And I'll mention again that we are hiring, so come talk to us if you're interested.